Hey everyone and welcome to Sasquatch Theory. In today's video, I interview Shiloh who had some encounters and experiences during his time in Washington State. This is another instance where the Sasquatch are coming out of the depths of the forest and coming in close contact with humans in their backyards. I think it's wild how researchers will travel the ends of the earth and stay out for many nights hoping to experience at least a tree knock. And then you have random people who are just minding their own business, doing their own thing that run into the Sasquatch. It's hard to say where these beings will be and what their true motivation really is. In this video, Shiloh talks about these strange Sasquatch dreams he keeps having after the encounters he experienced. All right, guys, let's dive straight into this next Sasquatch encounter from the state of Washington. All right, Shiloh, welcome to Sasquatch Theory. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. How about yourself? Not too bad. I'm trying to stay out of the heat. Shiloh, if you would... Tell us a little bit about yourself and your Bigfoot encounter from the very beginning. All right. My name is Shiloh. I'm 24. I was born in Alabama, raised in Missouri and Michigan, lived in Washington State for two years. Now I live in New York, in Troy, New York, upstate New York. And um, I've had several Sasquatch encounters. Um, and the first one that I had was when I was really little. I was probably seven, eight years old, and it was right before the 2008 recession hit. Um, my family lost the house that we lived in in Missouri, and we were going to move out west to California to live with some family. And we took the Jeep um, out into the country, and the Jeep broke down like an hour after we left. And we luckily were right in front of a campsite. And this campsite was in the middle of nowhere, pretty much, in Missouri. And I don't know exactly where it was, which I guess is good for the Sasquatches. But um, I remember it was the second night that we were there. The sun was just below the horizon. And we had this little campground by the lake. And my family was out grilling hot dogs and stuff. And I went back behind the campground into this little clearing. It was probably a hundred meters wide and it was surrounded by trees and the woods, the wood line further back was pretty sparsely wooded, but it was still dark back there. There wasn't any bushes or anything. It was all flat. And I was in this grassy field that had tall grass and um, there was a patch of dirt in the middle of the field. And I was just a kid, you know, I was like upset that we were losing our house and I was just exploring that area trying to get my mind off of it and i was stabbing sticks into the ground and stuff and messing with rocks and doing kid stuff um and i remember hearing this weird rustling you know i can hear my family they're out there like 100 feet away from me 200 feet away from me i can hear this rustling to my right and i look over there and i see this guy in the woods and i just see this figure and he's just peeking at me behind a tree and um, I looked at him and I went back to what I was doing and I looked at him again and he was running and he was running in between these trees and the figure just looked all black. It looked like a human being at first. Um, it was all black. It had no definitive features that I could tell at all. It looked like a guy that was just black head to toe, no face. I couldn't see a face. I couldn't see anything. And it was pretty dark in those woods. But the visibility was good. And um, I just remember him kind of flanking around me. I was facing towards the, my family's campground. And this thing was flanking around me. And I thought it was my brother at first. I thought it was like my brother or my dad playing a prank on me or trying to come up behind me to scare me or just doing something, you know, for fun. And um, I didn't really get a good look at it until... I tried to trick it. I was like playing a game as a kid and I'm like, well, 
if this thing's trying to hide from me, it kept peeking in and out behind the trees and I couldn't really see it, its whole body, except for when it would peek, I saw its head. But um, I could see its legs running and it was just darting in between these trees. So I decided I'm just going to act like I'm going to go back to the campground and I'm going to turn around really fast to see if I can see it out in the open. And that worked. And I looked forward for about 10 seconds and I stabbed the stick into the ground and I acted like I was walking away. And then I turned around as fast as I could to where I, I had last seen it. And I saw this thing, its whole body. I saw its legs. I saw its arms. Um, the legs were really long. And the arms were really long, too. It had really long arms and really long legs. And at that point in my life, I still thought that it was a man. I thought it was a man, but he had gotten closer to me. Or they had gotten closer to me. And um, I realized that this isn't my dad. You know, this isn't my brother. The creature was about six feet tall. Um, so it wasn't, like, insanely large or anything, but he was slim. He was, like, lanky. And I just started getting really uncomfortable. Once he started getting close to me, I just got this feeling in my stomach that I'm like, I need to get out of here. So I just ran back to the campground and I never told anybody about that. And um, that experience was with me in the back of my mind, kind of repressed. I just forgot about it as I got older and I didn't realize that it was anything other than a man. But um, later on, I had seen, you know, the footage of Patty and I saw some Sasquatch content like Finding Bigfoot and whatnot, different TV shows. And I realized that maybe that thing could have been a Bigfoot just because of the way it was acting. It was weird and coming up behind me and darting and peeking and all this stuff that was just non-typical of a human doing that unless they wanted to kidnap me. So that's what I had thought. I'm like, well, maybe it was a person that was wanting to kidnap me. So after that happened to me, I figured it was just a human being for a long time. I didn't even really think about it. But when I was a teenager and up until I was a preteen teenager, I started having a lot of Sasquatch dreams. And I didn't know that much about Sasquatch. I didn't really hear about it. Nobody ever talked about it to me. And I just started having really vivid dreams of like riding my bike in the woods and having this huge, giant, hairy thing chasing after me in my dreams and like pacing me alongside the woods and i had never heard of anything like that in my whole life you know all i had was that one experience that i thought was a human and i kept having these bigfoot dreams and i've had probably 20 bigfoot dreams when i was a kid and um as a result i was very interested in hearing other people's encounters you know like looking it up online and just hearing people's reports and hearing everything that people have to say and I became very open-minded to cryptids and things like that, like Dogman and Sasquatch, just because of how interesting it was to me and how I felt like I might have had an experience like that, but it wasn't so definitive at first. And um, I didn't have any Sasquatch experiences up until I lived in Washington. And I moved out to Washington when I was like 20. And um, I, I was living with my partner at the time, my ex, and I didn't really know that there were sasquatches there like i had heard that in washington there's there's bigfoot i figured they were up in the mountains and just out in the wilderness you know what i mean but i didn't really i didn't really know that they could be where i was which was in a little town called paulsbo um it's not a super big town uh, we were like 10 minutes away from downtown which the downtown area is like on the water and there's a lot of little restaurants and stuff there but we could walk to the downtown if we wanted to from the apartments and the apartments was a place called Scandia Knolls, and it was nearby Fish Park in Paulsbo. And Fish Park isn't super big. It's, it's like a little park that connects to a salmon breeding area, like young salmon and stuff go there to lay their eggs. And even down there, when I went to that park, before I had my encounters, there was a mural there, and I noticed that there was a Bigfoot there on the mural painted under this bridge. And um, I thought that that was very interesting because I'm like, well, maybe there are Sasquatches around here, but I wouldn't know it. You know, I, I'm like, I, I never go out in the woods or nothing. And um, I, I would like to hike, but I'm just disabled. I broke my back when I was a kid and I just can't walk for very long. I can still walk, but I can't be out in the woods for too long without being 
injured essentially. So I have to kind of, I'm a homebody and I like staying in um, and I'm an artist. So while I was living in Washington, I was just on the computer doing my art, you know, getting paid to draw people stuff. And um, the night that I had a, an encounter was right outside the apartment. It was behind the apartment. I would go out on the third floor balcony at night just to relax and cool off. And I'm just a night owl type of person. I like to stay up late and listen to music and draw and stuff like that. So every time I need a break, I would just go outside and sit there for 20 minutes or so and smoke a cigarette or just relax, hit my vape. And um, nothing had happened for a year. I was doing that. I was outside almost every night for hours outside, like two or three hours a night, just relaxing, just enjoying the view because it was it's really pretty out there. And right behind the apartment, there's a dog park that's just kind of open and there's a little play area and a little picnic area. And then there's a thick wood line that has cherry trees and it's just very impenetrable thicket. And you can get in there with a trail, but it's so it's like you can only get in through the trail. You can't enter the woods from any other area because it's too thorny and too thick and too dense. And um, basically, I was listening to some Sasquatch encounters. And I had I remember opening a video of Sasquatch vocalizations by Ron Moorhead, and I just had it open. I didn't listen to it. I didn't play the video or anything. It was just open, and I was going to watch it sometime later. And I went outside for a cigarette, and I sat there for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 50 minutes. I was just chilling out there, and I remember hearing these whoop sounds, and it was a two-tone whoop call and it was down in the woods and um it sounded like later i knew exactly what it was at that time i thought it might have been two owls because because i heard one and then i heard another one on the left side of the woods i heard the first one on the right side of the woods and it was like they responded to each other and i'm like well maybe it's in a mating pair of owls or something and um I had never heard owls like that before, though. I had heard barred owls out there. I had heard western screech owls out there, but I had never heard any owl that sounded like that. So I'm like, maybe it's a, just a new kind of owl I've never heard. Um, but I remember looking it up afterwards, and I couldn't find any owls that sounded like that. And that was the beginning of my encounters. Um, and that night, I sat out there, and I heard footsteps approach the front of the wood line. It's like they came up from below um the woods down there are really steep it's like a 45 degree 40 degree um decline into those woods and it gets really brambly and thicket thickety down there and it's really challenging for me to go super far down there sometimes i'd walk in there and go to like a tire swing that's down there but um i wouldn't really go down there very often i went down there maybe 10 times in the two years that i lived there and um yeah that night i remember they walked up to the wood line and it was very quiet um that night there was no wind it was just pitch black out there was no moonlight there was no wind at all it was a warm night it was like 75 degrees and i heard those footsteps approaching and they were very subtle but it was so quiet that i could hear them and i figured well maybe it's a person walking down there or maybe it's a deer that just walked up and it'll pop out of the woods soon because um, a lot of the time the deer would come up through those woods and go to the park and eat grass or whatever, eat flowers in the field. And um, they sat there, whatever these things were, sat there for like an hour. And it was in the middle of June. It was like June 15th or 16th, um, 2021. And they basically sat there picking cherries off the tree, eating the cherries and spitting the pits out. And it was so dead quiet that I could hear them pick the cherry off the tree. And it was right behind the big cherry tree that had really ripe cherries at that time of year. And I, I knew because I went down there and had some and they're delicious cherries. And um, I could just hear them keep picking it. And they probably ate thousands of cherries for all I know. But I kept hearing that pitter patter sound of them spitting the pit out into the bushes and picking the cherries off the tree. And I thought, well, maybe it's something, you know, I tried to justify it as, oh, it's a raccoon in the tree or something. Um, but I didn't hear anything else and there was no people, there was no lights, you know, there's no way that somebody could walk down there in the middle of the night with no lights. And it sounded like they were walking around on two feet. But 
I didn't hear anything for that two hours besides the cherries, the two whoop calls, and them just sitting there like mouth noises, you know, like something eating those cherries. I could just hear that. And so after a couple hours of sitting there, I figured, well, maybe it is Sasquatches. And I didn't expect them to be in this area, but I decided to test them to see if there are Sasquatches and I'd want them to respond. So I started clicking my tongue at them because I kept hearing these little click noises and they would click on the right and then on the left and then I would click and then the right would click again and the left would click and we started triangulating our tongue clicks. And that's exactly what it sounded like. It sounded like three people clicking their tongues um, in order. And we did that probably 10 times. And that's when I realized that this isn't something that I'm used to seeing out here. It's not something that I'm used to interacting with. I didn't even have to see them at first to know that it could have been Sasquatch just from the way they were behaving and how long they were just sitting there eating cherries. You know, there was no, they were very quiet. And so I decided to whistle at them. And this was at midnight. I went out there maybe 10 p.m. And I sat out there for a couple hours, heard all that stuff, and I decided to whistle at them. And I whistled the ruse whistle from Hunger Games. I didn't even know what whistle it was at the time. I just whistled it. And I whistled as loud as I possibly could. And that was the start of the most traumatic experience that I had with Sasquatches and the most intense experience of my life. Because the second I stopped whistling, they started blasting me with this projected dread. And it was so strong that it felt like I was going to die that second. It went from me being curious and being like, oh, maybe it's Sasquatches. Let me test them out or see if how they react, if it is them, um, to me being in fear for my life, standing on the third floor balcony. And um, I could feel the projected dread. I could feel the infrasound from them. And it felt like three beings standing right next to each other at the front of the wood line blasting me at the same time it felt like a dread laser beam that they're shooting directly into my body and i the way that it felt was so bizarre that i could even in the blackness i could tell where their heads were in the wood line and they were right next to each other it felt like three entities right next to each other blasting me and it was like an invisible sound or it was like an inaudible sound that i couldn't explain and it was so instant. I've never felt more instant dread in my whole life. And it was so strong that I was shaking and I became adrenalized. And that isn't the only thing that happened at that moment. Because after I whistled, they started blasting me with infrasound. And the one that was on the big cherry tree on the, on the right, um, he was obviously a male. He took a huge intake of air. It, it was such a massive intake of air. Like he sucked as much air as he possibly could into his lungs and he bolted down the hill, stomping as hard as he possibly could. And he was hyperventilating. It's like he forced himself to hyperventilate to oxygenate his blood. And it sounded like a human rhythm. You know, it was like, <laughs> except it was so much bigger. It was like 150 times the volume of what a person could do. It sounded like he sucked in all of the air that surrounded him in like a 150 foot radius. It was so intense. It sounded like industrial airflow. You know what I mean? Like it was just so much air that he was breathing in and out. And it was so loud. And the stomping, that he started the stomp and he sprinted down this hill while stomping. And he got to the bottom of the hill in maybe 10 steps, seven, eight, 10 steps, something like that. And he was all the way at the bottom of the woods after he did that. From the top of the woods, he went, he bolted like 200, 300 meters down those woods in six seconds. And the stomping was so loud and aggressive that I could feel the vibrations from those stomping, from that stomping emanating from the woods. And the vibrations went up the entire apartment building and into my body. And I could feel those vibrations in my whole body. And it was just insane. I felt every single footstep, even the one at the bottom of the um, hill in those woods. Um, I felt those vibrations and I was like, how is nobody waking up and hearing this right now? Like nobody came outside or anything, but 
I was freaked out. Um, that was the end of it. It was the intimidation is like he was ripping up bushes while he did that. It was so much at once. They blasted me with infrasound. He started stomping. He was huffing and puffing. Um, he was ripping up bushes and he sprinted 45 miles an hour downhill down a 40, 50 degree incline in those woods. And I went inside. I opened the glass door. I went inside. I grabbed a flashlight. I went out there and I shone that flashlight into the wood line and it was dead silent. I didn't see anything. I didn't hear anything. And that was the end of that encounter that night. And I went back inside again and my ex had woken up from a nightmare. They said that they had a nightmare and I was just freaking out. I was adrenalized. I'm like, I think I saw something or I didn't see something yet. I think I heard something crazy down there. I'm pretty sure there's Sasquatches down there. And, um, it was insane. I could tell that it was at least four of them down there, like a family of them. And that was the first intense encounter that I ever had. And um, it was two nights later that I had my next encounter where I still didn't see them yet, besides the one when I was a kid. But I went out there and I didn't learn my lesson because I, I heard them approach the woodline. It was the same thing, except no hoop. Um, I heard them walk very subtly up to the woodline, and I whistled as loud as I possibly could. I whistled the Kill Bill whistle. I whistled the whole thing. And right when I stopped that whistle, right when I was done with it, this thing snapped a tree, and it snapped it like it was a toothpick. It snapped it in one go. There was no creaking of the wood. There was no sound of splintering. It was just pop. And it was like a wooden shotgun blast going off. And that made me jump. That made me, that made me so insanely scared. And at that moment, I realized mentally that whatever this thing is, it could jump up onto the third floor balcony and just rip my head off before I had time to even get inside. If that's what it wanted to do, I'm not safe in the apartment building. It can just bust the wall down. It can do whatever it wants with me because of that strength it showed how powerful it was to me that it could just rip me in half if it wanted to and that scared me um that scared me bad and i started having nightmares after that with the infrasound i started having nightmares where i'd be in the woods and i would feel this infrasound feeling again and i would just wake up sweating and um yeah the last the last time that i saw them was it was probably 2 or 3 months after that several weeks after those two encounters i would hear them outside sometime and i started gifting them stuff because i didn't want to be on their bad side you know i felt like they didn't like me and i wanted to have if they're going to be out there i want them to not hate me for sitting out there you know like i want to still enjoy my night and be able to go out there and you know i can't go outside any other time so i like going out there but um i went down in those woods in the morning and I put apples down there. I put suckers down there. I put cherry suckers. I would put Swiss rolls down there in little baggies and hang them up in the tree branches where they had been standing. And um, I saw footprints down there. Nothing super definitive, but I could tell where they had been standing. Um, I found the tree that they snapped, which was about six inches in diameter. Um, it, it was a pretty big tree that they had snapped. And I took a picture of it. I sent you that picture from, I took that from the balcony several months after they had broken it. And that tree snap is about 11 feet off the ground where it snapped. And there's nothing around it that's broken. You know, it's just that tree. And it was a healthy tree. It sounded healthy. It didn't sound like it was dead or nothing. And the night that I put the suckers out, um, I went out there to check if they had gotten them or if they were there. And they were. And I heard them sucking on this sucker and they were doing it really loud. Like, it's almost like they wanted me to know that they were sucking on this sucker. And it's like I could hear the spitty mouth noises and them, you know, smacking their lips and basically acting like it's the best thing that they've ever had. And I thought that that was really funny. So I started laughing. And a while after that, they started making me laugh more. They would make weird noises and just unique noises that would catch me off guard and make me laugh a little bit even though i was terrified still i would go out there anyway because i was so interested in them and i i wanted to communicate with them if possible i could tell that they were super intelligent i would i could tell that i had disrespected them by whistling and 
after a while, um, part of the experience was them throwing pebbles right above my head. And I could hear these little taps on the roof of the balcony. And it was directly above my head. And they kept doing that. And it almost sounded like a big raindrop hitting the, the rooftop. But those days, there was no rain. There was no wind. There was nothing. And it was just them throwing these tiny little pebbles. And that got confirmed to me one day when I went out there. I was looking in the wood line on the left. And it was dark. But there's a light that's in between the apartment buildings that casts on the front of the wood line. So you can't see into the wood line, but you can see the front of the wood line just fine. And I see this arm. It was a black, hairy arm come up super high over these bushes. And it threw it like you would throw um, a, you know, a, a pebble or a rock if you try to throw a rock as, as hard and as far as you can. That's what it looked like. It looked like a hand and an arm. All I saw was the arm. But right after that, it was 10 seconds or so before I heard the pebble hit the top of the roof. And it was right above my head, as always. You know, it's like they were so accurate with throwing it. And I realized that that's what they were doing the whole time, that it wasn't any weird noise. It was just them throwing these little tiny pebbles. And they would probably be the size of a piece of corn, the, the pebbles that they were throwing. And they were so accurate with it that I was just amazed. I was very impressed by their ability to throw so accurately up in the air like that. And um, I kept I kept trying to interact with them and I started to feel certain things from them. I would feel emotions from them. Like I could tell that they were there and they would confirm that for me by making a weird noise or breaking a branch or walking around down there or you know exhaling really fast and i can just tell it's them because of how big and strange those sounds are down there and i would see the glint of their eyes peek around the trees and it was just the glint of their eyes and they would just stare at me and watch me as i'm sitting up there smoking cigarettes and stuff and um, i think they liked the smell of the cigarettes and i i remember the times where i saw them look at me from the woods um it was probably like 30 or 40 times different days, different nights that they would come out there and I would see them just look at me and just watch me even far past when the cherries were off the tree and there's no food down there. There was no, there was really no berries around that area. Um, they would still come and they would still look at me and they started projecting these feelings to me. And I started trying to project feelings back to them. It's like I could feel their emotions and I started trying to project my feelings and emotions to them and my thoughts and just try to ask them questions with my thoughts. And I never heard them say anything in my head, but I, the feeling that they can give you is so bizarre. It's like they can make you feel anything that they're feeling. And um, I'm just a little bit more about me. I was I grew up and I was abused by my dad and. I have PTSD from that. I've got CPTSD from the abuse. And I sit out there at night just to kind of calm my mind down. So I stop having flashbacks and I stop freaking out and I stop being sad. Right. And sometimes I would go out there and it would be a bad night. And I was just crying out on the balcony and they would always try to distract me. Anytime I would get a flashback, it's like they could tell that I got a flashback at that moment and they would try to distract me by breaking a branch or making a weird noise or you know making a grunt or burping or doing something weird when the rest of the night they would be very quiet it's like the second i started having a negative thought or a really negative emotion they would like divert my attention to them instead and it started to really help me deal with those emotions it helped it literally started helping me process my trauma as a kid, because they were there for me. It's like every time that I had a flashback, they knew and they were there and they knew how to get my mind off of it. And that was something I had never experienced ever in my life from a human being. You know, it's like they could tell what my emotions were, they could tell what my state of mind was, and they were attracted to me. It's like they just kept wanting to come out to visit me in a way. And even though I was scared of them, I was just like uncomfortable with them. I kept asking them and i would say it out loud too i just ask them questions and i would be like hey you can show yourself to me if you want to you know you can come out and i i won't be scared i might be scared a little bit but i'll really appreciate that if you show yourself to me 
And I asked that for maybe two weeks and I kept giving them apples and snack cakes and stuff. And one night after asking them so much, one of these things, I saw a black blob come out of the right side of the woods and stalk over the dog park or along the field. And it, at first I thought it was a deer. It was moving pretty slow and it just looked like a black, dark animal. And I couldn't tell what it was. It was too undefined. It was too dark over there, but it had stalked over low to the ground. It stalked over to this planted, to these planted trees. Um, excuse me. There was a little hill of planted trees and it stalked over to the, that little hill and it just stood there for a while. It didn't stand there on two legs. It was just, you know, relaxing there, I guess, or waiting for its opportunity. And I kept looking over there, but I couldn't really tell what it was. So I'm like, well, maybe it's a deer because it's not really acting like anything weird. You know, like deer do that sometimes. Sometimes the deer would come out and they would. There was only one time where I saw a doe come out and I was like, wow, that doe is really afraid where she came out of the woods and she was along the wood line and she kept looking behind her. You know, she kept she kept turning her head and just staring behind her and she wasn't moving at all. She wasn't eating. She would just look behind her and look forward again and look behind her. And I could just tell that she was scared. Like I'd never seen a deer be so um, uptight before. It's like most of the time they were very relaxed. They really liked that area. They would come out at night all the time. And um, the one time that I saw it stalk across the field, I looked over to the left and it started I looked over to the left for maybe three seconds. And as I looked forward again, this thing was right in front of me. And it stepped into the light in between uh, that was casting on the wood line from in between the apartment buildings. It stepped right in into that light in front of the wood line. And it started with a stomp. It was on all fours and it stomped its front arms. And then as it's going to the left, it stomped its back legs together. It stomped its front arms together and then its back legs and then its front arms again. And then it stomped its back legs and it stomped. It did this like gallop while it was doing it. It, it looked like a deer that had been spooked, but it was doing it in a very controlled way. The movement of it was very controlled and it was like it galloping and stomping its feet back and forth um, over and over again. And as it's going to the left, it just had his head up and he was looking ahead. He never looked up at me or anything, but it was slim thick. Um, he, he, you know, his arms and legs looked kind of like tree trunks. They weren't like super thick, but they were thicker than a deer's or a bear's would be. And it didn't have a round, butt. it was very flat. Its back was flat. It didn't have a tail. I could see the shape of its legs. I could see its entire silhouette against the wood line and it was pitch black. Um, I saw the glint of this thing's butt where its butt was towards the light that was emanating from in between the apartment buildings. And I saw the glint of it and it looked shiny. I could tell that it had a shiny coat on it because of that glint on its rear end. And um, its head was round. It didn't have a snout. It had no snout. It had no ears visible. It had no tail. Its legs and its arms were very similar length its arms were just slightly longer than its legs and um it had a barrel shaped body it had a barrel chest it was very rectangular its body shape and its back was flat and slightly angled up and its head was just planted directly on its shoulders and it was just looking forward um it had no neck and it looked strong and that stomp that it did i could still feel those stomps in my body, but it wasn't nearly as big and as um, insanely loud as the big male that had did the intimidation display uh, at me first. Um, this was like several weeks later, I had actually seen the juvenile and I knew that it was a juvenile just because of the comparison between the huge one and the way it was breathing and stomping. And this one, it was still like four feet tall, four to five feet tall on all fours. And I, I believe that if it stood up on two legs, it would definitely be capable of it. If it stood up on two legs, it would be nine feet tall, anywhere from seven to nine feet tall. And um, it didn't make any noise other than the stomping. I couldn't hear breathing. I never heard a stink or I never smelled any stink for any of my encounters. I never smelled any stinky odor or anything like that. 
Um, there was one night where I could smell a little bit of hair in the air. It's like a very faint hair smell, like unwashed hair. But it wasn't dirty. It wasn't a filthy smell or nothing. Um, and that was the first time that I had definitively seen a Sasquatch. I'm like, that was a Sasquatch. There's no way that it, it could have been anything else. Bears have snouts. Bears have ears. Bears have tails. Bears have a bulbous rear end. Bears have very uniform, like they have a very recognizable silhouette. And that thing was not a bear. And um, I kept having activity at that location. Um, and there was more activity at my ex's um, parents' place. We would go up, up the peninsula in Kitsap County, go up to Hansville at the top of the peninsula at a place called um, Skunk Bay Road. And it's, it's all the way up at the tip of the peninsula and it's all wooded up, up there. It's all private property. And they have a house up there in the middle of the woods. And my ex's dad, their stepdad, told them and their family that he had found a human shit in, he found human excrement in his backyard, like around where there was this old shack that they don't use anymore. It was like a mushroom growing shack and they don't use it. And there was just a big pile of crap there. And he said, oh, there's squatters out here and there's homeless people who are pooping on my lawn. And I'm, I, I just thought after I had had my encounters, I'm just like, there's no squatters out there. There's nobody out there. That's way out in the middle of nowhere, pretty much on the tip of the peninsula. You know, homeless people are in the city. You know, they're not they're not typically out in the woods on private property where you could get shot, you know, and then they're bold enough to take a shit right behind your house you know that doesn't really make sense to me but he's like oh it's these drug addicts who are doing this and he never saw anything all he found was the poop and it was a very big one apparently so i thought that that was very interesting um well after that i went there to visit for a couple weeks and we had the house to ourselves and as their parents were leaving i mentioned it to them i'm like hey have you seen anything weird around here have you you know had any weird experiences and she was like hey, what, do, what do you mean and i was like well i've been having these big hairy man experiences and that's all i really said at first and she was like oh yeah you know and she told me the story of how her daughter she's like 16 now 15 or 16 now but when her daughter was like a toddler like three or four years old she was out in the front yard in that same spot that we were at playing and she was just in the driveway and she had seen a huge man standing right in the bushes, right at the front of the bushes, just looking at her. And she said that he didn't look mean or anything, but he was like eight feet tall. He was really, really tall. And he was very big. He was very buff and hairy. He had like dark brown hair. And it was clearly a male, had very defined musculature. And she said that that was the only experience she ever had. And she didn't even remember it as she got older. Um, like if you were to ask her today, hey, do you remember seeing that Sasquatch? She would probably be like, nah, I, I don't remember anything about that. But her mom definitely remembers it. And she remembered it for all those years. Um, and that so she could tell me. And I started having experiences there. While we were there, I started having more Sasquatch activity up there. Either they followed me up from Palspo or they were just there already and they took interest in me. Um, that's that's one of the reasons I believe that tagging is a very real thing in the cryptid community, that if you have one encounter with these things, you can be tagged either spiritually or psychically or physically. They tag you and they can follow you and they, they know where you're at and they take more interest in you now that you know that they are there versus people who have no idea that they're there. It's like they take a more keen interest in me than as compared to anybody else that lived there and i was like why why me why do they keep visiting me why do they keep following me why do they keep showing themselves to me why are they even interested in me at all and maybe it's because i'm sensitive maybe it's because i'm autistic and they would see me out there rocking back and forth or just stimming and you know doing stuff with my hands or making weird noises you know i'm that type of person where i don't care i'll just rock and home to myself and make weird noises and people think i'm weird but they didn't think i was weird at all they thought i was cool i guess because they kept following me around and at that at that location we were there for maybe three or four days 
we were sitting outside at night. I had told my ex about those en- encounters already, and they started having Sasquatch dreams, which I thought was very interesting. And um, we sat out there at night, and we were just listening, waiting for something to happen, you know, playing music really quietly. And then we would turn the music down and just try to listen to anything around us. And we never heard anything. It felt weird. It felt like you got eyes on you, even though it's pitch black out there. Um, around those houses, there's just bushes everywhere. There's berry bushes. There's wild salmon berries. There's wild raspberries. And it just keeps going. Blueberries, there's berries everywhere. The whole entire forest floor is berries. And there's a lot of structures up there too. There's lots of weird arches and broken trees and just pushed over trees and stuff that you wouldn't normally see in other wooded areas. And um, it's a very interesting spot. You know, you can go for a walk and just fill your belly on berries. It's a very nice spot for them to be. And that's why I figured, well, if they're down in Paulsbo, they got to be up here, too. There's no way that they're not up here. There's rocky cliffs up here. There's beaches. There's a swamp. There's a marsh. There's woods. There's no reason why they wouldn't be up there. And um, the first weird experience that I had there was a footprint that they left me. And it was a couple days after we went there. There was nothing out there at first. I didn't see anything. And then the next morning that we went outside out front, Right out front, right in front of the bushes, in front of the house, there was like a little patch of pine needles, and there was a footprint there, and it wasn't there the night before. It was very obvious, and it it, it looked weird because the pine needles that are under the footprint, it didn't just smash the pine needles down. It's like it, it moved the pine needles out of the way and embedded its foot into the ground. Because there was pine needles there before. So it's like it moved these pine needles out of the way and placed a rock in the middle of its own footprint right in front of the house. And it was just a very clear, defined footprint. And um, we found a piece of hair on it. We found a whole clump of hair. And it was this light brown hair. And I have black, long, curly hair. And my partner had black hair. And their whole family had black hair or gray hair. And this hair was light brown and it was long and it was in a clump. And when we looked at it really close, it had frayed edges. It's like the hair had never been cut before. At the end of the hair, there were frayed edges or it was just tapered. It's like it wasn't a normal human hair. If you look at the end of your hair as a human being, if you've ever had a haircut, the end of your hair is going to be blunt. You know, it's not or unless you haven't had a haircut in a long time, it's going to be a little frayed maybe. But if you've got healthy hair and you cut your hair, your hair is going to be blunt at the end. So I'm like, this is probably Sasquatch hair. Like, I have no reason to believe that it isn't. And we also found knuckle prints out there. The knuckle print that I sent you a picture, uh, sent you a picture of, it's about a foot long in that dirt patch or that muddy patch there. And before there was all grass there. And I don't understand how it got rid of the grass there. Like it was just sitting there or it had its knuckle down on the ground or something. It just looked like a really weird kind of hand-ish print. But I couldn't tell exactly where on its body that print was made from. Um, And I did have some other weird experiences there. Like there was the light that I saw. I got a video of it. Me and my ex were on a walk. And right as we left the house, we looked over into the bushes and saw this light. And this area, by the way, is the same area where my ex's mom told me that story about her little girl seeing that Sasquatch right there. It's in the exact same area, except the Sasquatch was in the front of the bush. So this light thing, whatever light it is, was back in the woods, probably 150 feet, 200 feet or so. And it was emanating its own light. Um, It was about 7.38 p.m. at night in June, July. And the sun had just peaked under the horizon it just dipped under the horizon so the only sunlight that there was was at the tippy tops of the trees like you could see the sunlight hit the tip the tips of the trees and that was it there was no sunlight casting into the woods or anything like that and we could tell with our naked eyes that this thing was emanating its own light it had its own light um and on top of that it was very bright it was very colorful you could tell the color of it changing from pink to blue to orange to white, to invisible. Um, And I thought that that was very interesting. I'm like, what is this thing? And we're both looking at it. And I whipped my phone out to try to record it. And I think I got some decent footage of it. But it's like it's hard to see the color if it's 
because it's so washed out because it's it was slightly dim outside at that point but um i do feel like the the picture quality of it is good enough to see that it's a weird morphing light and it was also moving to the right and to the left like a person would if they were walking down there but that's why i called it a light entity because i'm like it looks like it was a light entity that was morphing color and walking back and forth in the woods and it vanished even while i was recording it the actual light that it was emitting was just gone and um i didn't see anything else in that video until a year later after i moved to new york i was looking at that video and i still don't know what it is i'm like what is this thing? Is it an orb? Is it a will-o'-wisp? Is it a ghost? Is it an angelic being? I have no idea. Um, but I saw this thing peeking around the tree in that same video. Um, I also saw a lot of weird movement in the bushes. Like it, it almost seemed like there were people walking back there, but I couldn't see anybody. There were no clothes. You know, it's like they weren't wearing clothes. They didn't have any noticeable colors. The only thing that was noticeable really was that light and then the movement of the bushes but there was no wind that day either absolutely no wind it was dead it was dead quiet there were no birds really and um we didn't see any birds at least that day but just the whole experience of it being there after it like just the fact that i know that this thing was peeking at me and i didn't even know that it was there and i got it on camera made me really excited like i'd never had anything like that happen to me i was already excited for the video to begin with because i'm like I, I have no idea what this light is i've never seen anything like that in my whole life i don't think i've never met anybody that's seen anything like that in their whole life either and um i saw that light again right before i moved away from washington it was the last day that i was at that house and we were about to leave it was like 11 30 at night we go out pack our stuff up into the car and I see this light again, and it's in the same spot, and it's the same thing. It's just a weird morphing light entity emitting its own light. And um, I didn't want to go in there. You know, I wasn't about to go into those bushes and try to see what it was because I don't want to just disappear. You know, I've heard plenty of stories. I don't want to just go missing. I don't want to vanish. I don't want to get killed. That's not my prerogative. You know, I'm invested in communicating with things, and I'm very curious, but I'm not. I'm not trying to get myself killed. And it just seemed like it wanted me to look at it. And that's all it wanted me to take note of it and then move on. And that's what I did. Um, I didn't record it the second time because I'm like, I already have it on camera. Um, but I, I do think that that was something supernatural. I think that that being there with the Sasquatch activity and knowing that I caught one on camera, at least what I believe is a Sasquatch on camera. Um, and even in the bushes, you can see a glint. It's like there's an eyeball that's glinting under those bushes. And it's like the weirdest thing ever, just the way that it's moving. And it looks like there's something under there, but it's like you can't really make out anything definitive. And um, I almost broke my feet stomping, trying to imitate that main Sasquatch, the first experience that I had with the huge stomping. Um, I couldn't walk for a couple of weeks because I got so excited trying to explain it. Um, and people didn't believe me anyway, you know, like my current partner believes me and my mom believes me and that's pretty much it. You know, nobody else, I can't really talk to anybody else about it. So, but those are generally what happened. That's generally what happened to me. Um, the only other thing that was part of the experience I forgot to mention was after I got infrasounded, um, it was a couple weeks after that where I got this vision and i had sat out there for a couple hours just asking them questions and um sometimes they would give me like non-verbal responses to my questions where they would move something or they would knock on a tree or they would tap rocks together or something to kind of signal yes for something and if they said if they say nothing it's like a no um at least for those ones and the vision that i got was of three faces like three sasquatch faces merging into one and it was a very quick vision and i don't usually get visions for anything other than art like i'll have a really good vivid idea for art and i'll try to make my art pieces but that was the only vision that i've gotten that was so powerful where i thought that they had given it to me it's like they projected that vision to me to show me how connected they are and that's how i felt like they were spiritual because that vision it's like they projected that at me and then i got this message 
like a concept that they are very spiritually connected and that they're very spiritual beings. And the three that infrasounded me are like triplets or like brothers and sisters, you know, like they're very connected. It's like there are three beings, but it's one spirit. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's only one entity that's broken into three different physical bodies. And I don't know if there's any truth to that or what, but that's just how they made me feel about that vision at the time that I got it. And I'd never gotten any other visions outside of that ever. You know, never got another vision from them. That was just extremely potent and vivid. And I'll remember that for the rest of my life. And I do think it's funny how I got the three infrasound, you know, the three beings infrasound in me. I could tell that it was three beings doing it at once. That's why it was so, so powerful. And um, I, I just think that that was confirmation for me that it was three beings because they sent me the vision of three faces. So it's like they showed me what they looked like without actually having to show me what they look like, you know. So that's a lot. That's a lot to go over, but that's the gist of my encounters. And um, yeah. All right, Shyla, I really appreciate you for taking the time to share your encounters with me. And I have a few questions before we end the interview, if you don't mind. Of course. Okay. When you encountered the first creature, it was hiding and peeking out from behind the trees. At any point, did you happen to see what the creature looked like or was it just a silhouette? It was an all black silhouette. I didn't see any features. Um, I saw its hands. I knew that it had hands. Um, I saw the length of its arms. I saw its legs as it was running in between the trees. But I didn't really see anything else because it was kind of dark in those woods. It wasn't pitch black yet, but it was like blue hour. It was almost blue hour, but he was all black. I, I didn't see any features, didn't see a face. And that's why it made it unnerved me, you know, because I thought it was my brother at first, but it unnerved me when he got closer and I still couldn't make out any features. I'm like, that's not my brother. That's not my dad, you know. But um, no, it looked like it had short hair. It didn't have shaggy hair or nothing. And um, it wasn't super tall. It was like six foot. It was slim. It was lanky. It was like tall and lanky. Yeah. Yeah, that is interesting. You said it was around six feet tall. That seems yes. to be like the average for Sasquatch, a little taller than six foot. Some are really tall, about 10 foot, 11 foot tall. And um, yeah. yeah, it's there's I, there I seems be to be no limit. I wouldn't be surprised if the one that was stomping around was 14 feet tall because it sounded like it was 2000 pounds. I mean, it sounded like an elephant ripping up those bushes. It was just immensely huge and heavy. And I, I know people will see them and say, Oh, it looked like it was 600 pounds, but you don't really know how much it weighs until you put them on a scale, you know? So maybe it was just really dense and big. And that was just an especially big one, but the other ones didn't seem as big. The ones that I actually saw didn't see as big. Didn't seem as big at all. Okay, and you didn't go and investigate the area. You kind of um, ignored them and turned around quickly, and that's how you you saw the whole creature step out. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. It's like he knew that I wasn't looking at him, so he showed his body, and I tricked him by basically making him believe that I was going away after I saw him. But um, I did get a good look at its whole silhouette when I did that. Um, the other areas I did investigate around the apartment building down by those woods and stuff. I went down there and I saw branches snapped and I saw weird stuff down there. I never found any hair or scat. There was a branch that was lodged up at, in one of the trails. It was like above the trail in this tree. And it was like 15 feet up off the ground. And it, it just looked very weird. It was just a big branch with leaves on it shoved into this other tree it was just from a totally different tree i had no idea where it came from and there wasn't any matching trees around you know yeah that is interesting i've noticed in the past whenever i would have activity if i just kind of ignored it i would experience more activity but if i try to knock back and interact with them it worked like the first or second time but eventually they'd quit responding but yeah i noticed when i'd ignore them i'd get more more results that's interesting. Well, I, I remember I did try to record them. I tried to record audio because I was wondering if they would ever make any crazy displays like that again. And I'd be able to get it on audio because if I did get it on audio, that would have been crazy. But um, 
every time I tried to record, I knew that they would out, they were out there. Like I'd get confirmation that they were visiting me or just the one was visiting me. And he would just kind of chill out there with me for a few hours. And um, I remember trying to record some audio, but every time I pressed record on my phone and brought my phone outside, they would never make a sound. It would be completely dead quiet, but they would still be there. And right when I put my phone away, I went and put my phone back inside, came back out, and they would make a noise. They'd break a branch or they'd whistle at me or they'd make a grunt noise, almost like, don't try to record us. Like, we know what you're doing. Or they could sense the electromagnetic field from my phone or the infrared light or something. It's like they could see it, that I had a phone on me, even if I tried to hide it and put it in my pocket and stuff. Like, they are so smart that they knew whether I had electronics on me or not, even if it was just in my pocket. And if, if I did, they would not make a noise. They wouldn't interact with me at all. If I went out there bare, basically, with no electronics on me besides a vape or something, they would make plenty of noises. They would, project, they would start projecting concepts at me. They would start answering some of my questions or giving me nonverbal answers. And um, usually that would entail them clacking rocks or throwing something or throwing a rock or throwing a rock above my head or um, walking around or you know, breaking a little twig or something. And I could tell that it was them, but yeah, they, they communicate in a very different way than human beings do. And they wouldn't communicate with me unless it was on their terms. Like I tried to lead conversations or lead the communication to get them to do something. They wouldn't do it. They only did what they wanted to do. And they wanted to communicate with me, but only the way that they wanted to do it, not the way that I wanted to. Yeah, that is interesting. And um, me and my friends have had the same experiences here in Missouri where they come up to the edge of the woods and you can hear them out there stomping around and um, eating food. That is interesting that they were eating cherries. And um, yeah, that sounds like yeah. Bigfoot activity to me. Yeah, lots of cherries. And they left so fast, too. It's like he got pissed off. That I whistled and then he's like, oh, well, we can't be here anymore. We got to leave. Um, but they did sit out there and eat cherries for two or three hours before they left in a huff and puff. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, when you experienced these dreams, now, were these just like regular dreams just about Sasquatch or were they like vivid dreams? They were a lot more vivid than regular dreams. And um, I used to smoke weed. Um and when I did, I wouldn't have many dreams. I got these dreams where I would be in the woods and I would be walking in this trail or riding my bike. And it was the same thing, almost like when I was a kid again, where I would just see this being in my dreams or I would feel the infrasound from it. I would just feel their presence. And it was so intense that it would make wake me up and I'd be sweating and I'd have to calm myself down after I woke up. Um, and there was one dream in particular that was super vivid where I was, it's like I was a different person. I was in the body of this kid who was like a teenage boy with his couple buddies. And they're all like 14 years old, 13 or 14. And they're walking down this hill. They start turning the other way to go down this embankment. And there's something on the left side of them in this sparsely wooded area. And it was just huge. It almost, in my dream, it looked like a, it almost reminded me of a giant sloth where it had this mossy brown color to it and very shaggy hair and the head was just huge and kind of projected forward on its shoulders and it turned around it looked directly at me and it ran towards us and started ripping us all apart and it ripped our legs off and ripped our heads off and ripped our arms off and then that was the end of the dream with blood and guts everywhere and i usually don't have dreams like that at all most of the time my dreams are very similar to each other and that those dreams were seemingly out of place like whenever i do have a nightmare i'll have a sasquatch nightmare usually but i did have one dogman dream after my sasquatch encounters too that was the same thing where there was a deer carcass that was outside the apartment on the hill and i looked at it and then i looked to the right and then i looked back at it and there's this huge black wolf creature standing over top of it and it looks up at me and projects the strat at me and it shows me its teeth it like opens its mouth and i can see its white long canine teeth and i'd wake up sweating and i'm like i don't know why i'm having dog man dreams when i just had a sasquatch encounter you know you would think i'd be having sasquatch nightmares rather than something like that but that was a big part of it because it 
it was so vivid and it impacted me almost as much as the real encounters did. You know, those dreams are so vivid. Mm, yeah, that is interesting. And that's a nightmare, not a dream. I guess essentially it's the same yeah. thing. But um, have you ever experienced ufo activity missing time have you ever woke up somewhere and you didn't realize you didn't know how you got there anything like that um i did see a ufo um after my encounters in washington it was like three months after the main intimidation display i was just out there at night there was no activity it was dead quiet i couldn't hear nothing and i just see this white light it looked like a white orb just shoot down directly into the woods and it shot down perfectly straight down and it was pretty quick and i thought it was a shooting star at first but it didn't have a tail and i could see it go into the woods it didn't go like behind the horizon it went into the middle of the woods and i waited for like 15 seconds i'm like what was that was that a drone or something and i was just sitting there minding my own business and i felt this projected dread at me again like like they were infrasounding me again but it was delayed. It was like 20 seconds after I had seen the UFO or whatever it was, the orb or UFO. It made me feel so uncomfortable that I, I feared for my life again. And I'm like, I'm going inside. I'm not staying out here after seeing that thing and feeling that feeling. You know, I'm a very sensitive person. I can feel other people's emotions. Like autistic people can be very hyper empathetic. And I feel like that kind of played into my encounters in a way where it made it easier for me to interact with them. It made me get the experience more than maybe somebody else would. And I saw like kind of autistic behavior in the Sasquatches as well. So I related to them. But um, other than that, I, I don't remember ever having any missing time or anything like that. But that was the only UFO kind of weird thing in the sky that I've ever seen. Okay. And do you have a history of paranormal activity? Uh, yeah, I do. I, I've had several paranormal experiences. Um, I had one where I had a vision of I was fully awake. I was fully conscious sitting in the living room in my grandma's living room at night. It's like 9 p.m. And I was just reading a book. And um, I have this vision and I look up and I just feel this presence of a man and he had gray hair and in the vision he he came his hand came towards my head and touched the side of my head on the top of my head and this was when i was 12 years old and the vision ended right then and i just got that feeling of a presence and then he was gone and um whatever it was the vision was over I, the presence feeling was gone and it, it wasn't until a couple weeks later i went to school and kids started saying, hey, Santa. And I'm like, what do you mean, hey, Santa? And they said, oh, well, you have gray hair on your head. And I'm like, what? What do you mean I have gray hair? And they pointed to the top of my head on the right side in the middle of my head on the top of my head. There was a gray streak of hair and it was a big one, too. And um, I hadn't ever seen that before. Nobody in my family had ever mentioned it. It's like that experience made me have gray hair. It was so bizarre. And um, I had another experience that was very specific where i used to when i was a teenager i would just walk alone at night a lot and it's very dangerous and i don't recommend anybody doing that but i was like a depressed kid and i i went outside a lot at night just to kind of chill and relax my mind and i would just walk around and i would usually never see a soul and um one night i walked into this neighborhood that i normally don't walk into that's right behind my house and I walked all the way down this road to the church parking lot and there's a church parking lot that's right on five mile road in Michigan. And, um, this parking lot is pretty big. It's like almost like a football field in length. It was, it's a, just a very large parking lot. And I approached the back left corner of this parking lot and there was bushes right at the back of the parking lot, like thick bushes. You can't see past them. And then there was a street light and that street was unlit. The whole street was unlit until you got to the church. And then the church parking lot was lit and it had street lights. So right as I got to this street light, um, I, I was at the corner of this parking lot and I look over to the opposite end of the parking lot at the opposite corner. And there was a man there and he was in his forties. He was like late thirties, forties. He was heavy built. He had a baseball cap on. He had a red t-shirt on shorts. 
and he was kind of chubby and he was looking directly away from me and he was standing directly under a street light and i was just on the edge of the street like i had been standing there for maybe two or three seconds looking at this guy and he turned around instantaneously he was sprint walking toward me like he knew that i was there he knew that i stepped into the light without having to see me and he turned around and started sprint sprinting at me so fast that I felt like I was going to die. I felt like he wanted to kill me. And luckily he was 300, 400 feet away. But just the aggressiveness of how quickly he turned and so purposefully with like the intent to grab me or something made me so fearful. And I just ran home. I've never ran so fast in my life. And I've never seen somebody physically move like that before. It's like, I had believed at that point that he was possessed, that that guy had some kind of possession. And I'm not a religious person either. I'm a spiritual person, um, but I've never really had anything to do with organized religion or any traditional religion. But that experience made me believe that that guy had some kind of demonic attachment that wanted to target me or that he was possessed and he wasn't really in control of his body. Because I tried to explain it like maybe he's on drugs. Well, how did he know that I was there? It's like he had previous knowledge that I was there to the point where he knew exactly where he was going to sprint walk towards. It was so scary. And being a little kid, I had no idea stuff like that existed. You know, I had had a little weird, little old weird experiences here and there, but nothing like that that was like a threat to my life. I felt like my life was threatened in that moment. And I was paranoid that he would follow me home in some or something, but nothing ever, nothing like that ever happened to me again. You know, that was the only experiences, the the only major experiences that I had. Okay, yeah, that gives me a better idea of the things that you've experienced in your life. Um, yeah, moving on forward, it seems like the Sasquatch are attracted to people who are injured or have some type of disability, and yeah. um. I don't know. It could be like a predatory thing where they can seek out, you know, the injured animals mm-hmm. or um, I don't know. Maybe there's something spiritual behind it because the Native Americans believe that they were like the healers of the forest or the guardians of the woods. And um, there are stories where they've saved animals or saved people from bad situations so they seem to arrive at the right moment and um, I could relate to your story because I was going through a lot of bad stuff whenever I had my encounters and they did they distracted me and um, every time they would do something it would take my mind further away from the BS that was going on in my life and um, exactly yeah with so much time passing of me not thinking about all the crap it, it ended up getting better you know and I had more to look forward to and I was doing the same as you going out there sitting out there every day and just listening for these creatures and seeing what else I could experience. That's amazing. Well, yeah, that's a very similar experience to me because I am disabled. My back is constantly in pain. And I feel like if they can read my mind to some degree or they can read my emotions or my mindset or my thoughts or whatever they can do, whatever abilities they have that we don't understand, that they knew that there was something wrong in my life. And even the even when I lived in Washington, the the relationship that I was in was just an abusive relationship. It was emotionally abusive and I was very unhappy and I was very angry and upset a lot. And that's so out of character for me. And um, there was even one night where I had a meltdown. When you're autistic, you have meltdowns, even if you're kind of on the higher functioning end of it. Um, I had a meltdown and I smacked myself in the head as hard as I could. And, um, I was just really upset and I went outside right after that to cool off. And um, I heard this like wail. It was like a wailing noise from the woods. And it was like, huh? (laughs) It sounded like it sounded like somebody saying, are you okay?" But just like the tone of it was like that. But it it sounded more like a moan. Like a a deaf person. Yeah, like a deaf person or something being like, are you okay?" And I just felt this like peace come over me that was not mine. You know, I was very upset in that moment, but I felt very peaceful when I went out there and sat down so fast and they were out there that night and started distracting me. And I realized that 
these things actually care about me to a degree. Otherwise, they wouldn't bother. It's like they would see me do something like that because you could see through the windows. You know, there were no blinds up there. We never closed the blinds. And um, they could just see right up into our apartment from those wood line, from that wood line and watch the TV if they wanted to, you know. And my computer was always there. So they could watch me all day if they wanted to. And um, I, I just felt very cared for more than I ca got cared for in my relationship which is just crazy to think that they didn't even have to physically interact with me, but they showed me that they cared about me. They invested time into me. And um, I've never experienced anything like that before. You know, animals are just incredible. They are animals. I do think that they're flesh and blood, but I also think that they have a spiritual side of them or that some of them are spiritual and some of them may not be, but those ones definitely felt spiritual and they felt connected to me. And not to mention, I've always had some kind of weird connection to these creatures ever since I was a little kid. Um, I do think that tagging is definitely a real thing where they can either smell you from super far away. They can track you. They can follow you. And if they know you, they're going to come visit you if they feel a need to. You know, So whatever they wanted, whatever their intent was, I think was to help me get out of a situation where I wasn't using my intuition anymore and I wasn't trusting my gut and I wasn't following my heart. And they completely changed that for me completely. And I'm in a, I'm in so much better of a situation now and in a relationship now. And it was because of those encounters that made me change my own life in a way. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And like I said, I can definitely relate to you on that situation um when you were going to play the ron moorhead sounds outside and you heard the whoop calls did you ever end up playing those calls um no i didn't i didn't play them for them i had just opened the tab and i was going to listen to it and i only had listened to it after i had those encounters to see what it was you know and to see if it was sasquatches and in the Sierra sounds, the first noises that the Sasquatch creatures make in that audio recording sounded exactly like the hoops that I heard, except the ones that I heard had no echo. Like if you go and listen to the Sierra sounds or the Missing 411 documentary, um, they hoop really loud and it has an echo. And the ones that were around me, it was the exact same noise, except there was no echo. It was like more of a padded sound. There's lots of bushes there, you know, that we're kind of catching that sound and not letting it travel very far. Yeah. Yeah. That is interesting. And I agree with you how these creatures can mark you and follow you around because here in Missouri, I was whitetail hunting and just going from like area to area, you know, different conservation areas. And it seemed like no matter where I'd go, I'd have something happen. Even if it was one thing, no matter what yeah. property I would go to, I'd experience something. It wasn't all the time, but here and there. Yeah, I, I do think that they just take interest in certain people. And I've had, you know, I've listened to people's experiences where they are touched by these creatures and they get healed. Like an area of their body that's injured, they can be touched and healed. And I'm like, dang, I wish they did that for me. I would be living my life like crazy right now if I could... <laughs> Mm -hmm. live like a normal person you know but yeah they I, did help me in their own way yeah yeah for sure I, I mean i can't prove it but after i made eye contact with the juvenile sasquatch my back got better like like it was a miracle really that's incredible mm -hmm. i mean obviously i can't prove that scientifically but the coincidence is there yeah yeah, lots of weird stuff started happening to me. I, I had a spiritual awakening after those encounters um, that related to everything that I said before about my intuition, and my heart. And I just had like a switch go off in my brain where I just started thinking differently. And it's like I'm a completely different person in that I don't have as many negative traits in me anymore. I don't have the negative thought patterns I used to even just a couple of years ago. And I think that 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 they are partially to, um, you know, to take credit for my personal life changes, you know, and that is incredible to me that I had seen these creatures, that they had affected me so much that um, nobody else really has those kinds of experiences and nobody around me, at least, you know, I relate to you in the same way because I've never met anybody that has had similar experiences that have changed them so much and so drastically and 
um, it's just incredible. Like these creatures are so much more than what people expect them to be. And I think that that's the most interesting thing about them, that there's so much to be discovered about them, about their behavior and about what they're capable of. Yeah, absolutely. And I definitely have a lot more clarity after I encountered them for sure. I just, I don't know. I see the world differently and yeah. um, I'm not, I'm not searching for the same things that I was in the past. I'm a lot more content now. Yeah. I feel very much the same way. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Did they ever take any of the cakes that you gifted them? Any of the food? Um. Yeah, they took pretty much every food item that I put out there except for oranges. I would put oranges out there and they never took any oranges. But they would take all the apples. They would take oatmeal cream pies. They would take Swiss rolls, Little Debbie stuff. They would take cherries. They would take grapes. They would take pretty much any kind of juicy type of fruit besides oranges. And um, I did put like little knickknacks out there for them to see if they would want to play with anything or have like a little trinket that they could take with them. They never took anything like that, but they would always take the food that I put out there for them, which I was very grateful for because they don't have to, you know, I feel like that's a sign of trust for them where they're like, I, I will take this one apple. It was only one or two apples at a time. You know, I wouldn't put a bag out there too broke for that <laughs> yeah i wonder if they ever ate that deer they had have been hunting it seemed pretty yeah. worried to be out in the yard like that it was very worried and also there was one time that reminded me of one time i was sitting out there and i heard their footsteps and i heard some tree knocks and they weren't up near the wood line like they weren't focusing on me that night and um i had heard there was like a little dog that used to yap down in the woods on the right side there's like a house over there and they had a little dog and that dog would just bark all night sometimes it wouldn't it wouldn't be constant but it, it would be sometimes and um i heard this dog sound like it's getting ripped apart and beat up and its legs are getting broken like it sounded like that it sounded like a dog just being tortured to death and it lasted 30 40 seconds and i'm like if these beings or a coyote or something is killing this thing, just kill it already. Like it sounds like it's suffering so much. And I realized that it could have been them. I realized, well, this could be Sasquatches because they mimicked a lot of things. They would mimic loons. They would mimic uh, owls. They would mimic different birds. They would whistle. Um, there was just a lot of things that they would mimic. So I'm like, well, maybe they could just mimic that weird noise. And they came up to the front of the wood line after the noise stopped. And they looked at me and I saw the glint of their eyes again. And I'm like, guys, if that was you, I literally said out loud, I'm like, guys, if that was you, don't do that stuff. Like, that's not entertaining to me. Like, you don't have to do that to get my attention or you don't have to do that at all because it just makes me feel uncomfortable. And they never did anything like that again. They never made any weird mimicking of animals being killed. And the next night, that dog was still barking out there. So they never actually killed that dog. That was the only dog that I ever heard in that area. So, Yeah, that is interesting. Um, what do you plan on doing with the wad of hair that you found, the vanilla colored hair? Um, I Originally, I was going to take it with me, but I just left it in Washington. So my ex, who I'm, I don't have any contact with, has that hair in a plastic bag. But I did keep a picture of it. Um, I basically excommunicated that person. So they're just not in my life anymore. I can't send it off to be tested or anything and we didn't really have the resources to do that you know and um i really wish that i took some but hindsight's 2020 20 and i did get some evidence i got enough to v validate my own experiences and to feel content with what happened without needing to you know i know these creatures are real i know that they are real and i don't need dna evidence uh, you know my prerogative isn't to um, prove that they exist my only motivation in sharing my story is to help other people that may have gone through similar things or may not know what they have gone through and hoping that the information that i have can help other people yeah very well and um i appreciate you for getting in contact with me and sharing all your encounters and experiences with everyone of course man yeah. Do you have anything else that you'd like to add? Any questions that you'd like to ask me before I end the show? Um, I, I would ask, what do you think about the government 
not revealing the fact that these creatures exist? Do you think the government knows they exist? Do you think they just don't want to reveal their existence because of the forestry industry? Or what is your opinion on that? I think it's a multitude of reasons, but if someone like me can have an encounter in their driveway, there is no doubt that the military, the government doesn't know about these creatures. And um, I think the reason behind it is, like I said, there's a bunch of reasons. The logging industry, the spiritual aspect to it. They don't want to admit that anything's spiritual nowadays. Even if there's yeah. proof, you know, it just gets written off and, you know, it's just like, oh, that was weird. You know, let's forget about that. Um, yeah, there's a lot of reasons, I think, just because people start flocking the woods. They'll want answers. People are going to demand that the government gives them answers, but also, you know, if it's tied into UFOs, aliens, they definitely don't want to tell us because they will go to extreme measures to hide the UFO alien information and they've popped people in the past and they'll continue doing it. I totally agree. (laughs) I I do think that they are trying to hide it as much as they can. I think that there's a lot of propaganda when it comes to Bigfoot that they, that the government specifically tried to make the topic be like a joke. Like they, they make it seem like it's just a joke and that it's just all fake and that everything is fake when really there's people that have been traumatized by these things. There's people that have been taken by these things, kidnapped, killed. There's people that have good experiences, bad experiences. There's people that have supernatural experiences in regards to these things. And, I, I just don't see why people aren't listening to actually, you know, people that have actually experienced these things are the people that people should be listening to because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, they're the ones that have the most information. They're the ones that are willing to share it. Even if the government has a bunch of information on these creatures or they have them in a laboratory somewhere, it's like, they're never going to tell anybody. And I, I just feel bad. I feel you know, sad for people in my heart that have gone through traumatic encounters like this and they don't have a support system and they have nowhere to go to and they have nobody they can talk to about it and everybody just thinks they're crazy. And I had that experience and I thought I was going crazy and I I pulled through it. I bare, I grit my teeth and just went through it knowing, being confident in myself, being confident in my perception and my experience and that's the best that you can hope for with somebody that goes through those experiences and just hope that they don't get too traumatized by it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. People would freak out if the government told them that they've been lying to everyone for so long and all these people and little kids that have went missing, it's because of Sasquatch, you know, there's a lot of reasons probably, and we'll never yeah. really know. Yep. It's a sick world we live in for sure. Yeah, they won't even admit the child abduction stuff, so they're never going to admit Sasquatch. I agree. All right, Shiloh, I really appreciate your time, and I enjoyed listening to your encounters. Well, thank you for having me on. (laughs) I really appreciate having the opportunity to tell it. Yeah, absolutely. And if you encounter anything else in the future, feel free to reach out to me, man. I just might. (laughs) Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, and you have a good one. Have a good day. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. All right, Shiloh, I really appreciate you for sharing your Bigfoot encounters and experiences. To me, it sounds like the Sasquatch really enjoyed the cherry trees and your friendship. It's hard to say if the Bigfoot have the ability to tap into our dreams, but I wouldn't be surprised if they could just because of all the other supernatural traits they have been known to have. I hope you guys are all enjoying Sasquatch Theory, and if you would like to help support the channel, you can give this video a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. You can also support the channel by purchasing some merchandise on my Spreadshop website. But yeah, that's all I have for you guys today, and I really appreciate everyone for watching. Thank you everyone, be safe, and take care.